Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's uh, SCR session, Meta Theory about our resources and capabilities. Uh, my name is Mahka Moin from University of North Carolina, and on behalf of the entire SCR team, I welcome you to today's session. Uh, so as uh, many of you have been joining us in previous weeks, uh, this is a continuation of a new series that SCR has started, Meta Theory, and we've already covered behavioral strategy, real options, and attention-based view with videos of all of them available on our website. And today we'll be talking about resources and capabilities. I would also like to put a place over for our next session about transaction cost economics in July, I encourage and invite all of you to join again. Uh, for today's session, resources and capabilities, uh, I'm very, very excited and honored to be joined by four distinguished panelists who have thought about this topic extensively. Connie Huffett from Dartmouth College, Asim Call from University of Minnesota, Kathy Maritan from Syracuse University, and Ralph Fielden from McGuire University. Our panelists will cover different aspects of resources and capabilities of theory from their own perspectives and sort of view this as, uh, as we have been talking about in many of our previous sessions, the limited time that we devote to these theories in these sessions won't really do any justice to the depth and breadth of ideas that scholars have contributed. So we're gonna do our best in at least covering a couple of them. And since we're all here, I would, it would be interested to know what is it that's uh, taking you, oops, sorry, I think I have a problem here. Excuse me. So my poll on this side is not uh, working properly. Typically in these sessions, uh, we had a poll like asking, uh, mm, attendees with respect to their interest in the session, whether they're familiar with these uh, with this theory before or if this is the first time that they are learning about this. So I apologize for this not working. We'll have to skip the poll this time. Actually, so Maka, let's just raise hands. Let's just do a quick yeah, poll. That would be wonderful. So I don't see the full screen in front of me. If uh, those of you who are here uh, with your research uh, resources and capability being your primary area of research, if you could raise your hand, that would be great. Excellent. So this is good. So this seems to be a much more familiar theory. In our previous sessions, we often had around 15% of attendees uh, having the focal uh, theory as their research area. So it looks like resources and capabilities are a lot more uh, popular. So as we go throughout the session, as we hear about uh, from our panelists, I would also like to invite you and encourage you to use the chat function to share your own perspectives about the theory, the ways in which you have contributed, you draw on it, and the ways you think there are opportunities for expansion of these ideas. Now, uh, let me share uh, my own perspective as a starting the session with perhaps some of the early building blocks of resources and capabilities theory, but the idea that when in strategic management research, we we'll think about resource-based view or capabilities, really the idea has started with this thought process that there is some competitive heterogeneity between, between firms, and that can be characterized by their resources and capabilities. And and this heterogeneity that can persist in meaningful and durable ways across firms can be then a source of either advantage or disadvantage for them. So that is really the intersection of strategic management thinking with these ideas. But the early building blocks of these uh, perhaps go back to Ricardo and the notion of Ricardian rent that has been around since early 80s with the idea that ownership of unique factors of production can be a source of economic value. And this is a time where like around the time that Ricardo suggested these ideas, thinking about economic rent was either related to uh, entrepreneurship that could leverage some disequilibrium in the market or those who could benefit from market power. But really this idea that perhaps uh, some differences across firms, some uh, ownership of idiosyncratic factors of production could then give rise to special performance by certain firms and entrepreneurs goes back to that original ideas. This line of thought has continued, I think, 
another breakthrough moment for it related more to strategy and uh, management is then this Penrose work in 1959 around the theory of the growth of the firm. And even though Penrose was essentially interested in growing organizations to understand the process of growth within firms, some of the building blocks of her theory really set the stage for thinking about firms as pools of resources, as collection of resources, and perhaps a distinction that she made between what is the actual resource versus the services that can be rendered from that resource, that distinction between the resource and the services of a resource could explain some of the subsequent heterogeneity across firms with respect to products that they have, the representation that they had on the market, because even if firms had particular similar resources, the ways that managers envisioned those services and they, that their judgments pushed resource investment and allocation could have been different. So building on these ideas, 1982 is really where some of the very insightful efforts to bring more of these ideas around resources and capabilities to strategy took form what Nelson and Winter's book around an evolutionary theory of economic change. And here again, Nelson and Winter were fundamentally interested in explaining economic growth at the economy economy level, perhaps patterns of technological change, but the building blocks of their theory, again, uh, stemmed from firm heterogeneity. That was a major assumption in their dynamic theory. And then the reflection that firms can be viewed from the perspective of routines that they have developed, these routines corresponding to perhaps genes in biological, uh, in a biology analogy, and then the ways in which these routines can create some continuity path dependence within firms so that the economic decisions, the strategic decision making within firms were no longer just economic, like mathematical maximization. Instead, it had to account for the ownership of resources, those path dependencies, and would have happened within the framework of what these routines and skills have provided. Now, with this background, the ways in which the strategic management research has really thought about resources and capabilities and why it had become very important for us perhaps goes back to how we connect the presence of resources and capabilities to the fundamental question of strategy being how is it that you achieve and maintain competitive advantage and here is where perhaps thinking about VRI and resources as ways in which you can protect hard to imitate resources that underpin a firm's strategy to build fences around what you have. This has been promoted by Jay Barney, Margie Pedereff's work around the mobility of resources and many others who have really contributed to this line of thought. And in parallel to this, we can think about another ways to link resources and capabilities to competitive advantage through the framework of dynamic capabilities. That here the idea is that instead of resources being constant and then having fences around them, you can constantly engage in a process of renewal and adaptation in order to achieve that advantage. And maybe these are resources that evolve one by one, or maybe there are higher order resources such as dynamic capability, integrative capabilities, and others that would really shape the foundation. And while this view of if I borrow the language of Rich McAdock, like resource building versus uh, resource of, sorry, fencing would like we connect these resources to that fundamental objective of sustained competitive advantage. Strategy scholars have also given a lot of thought to the inner working of firms and how is it that resources actually come to being, thinking about the origin of resource portfolios, perhaps. If some of these resources are not tradable on the market, then it goes back to the firm's internal processes for endogenous development of resources and perhaps adjusting and engaging in configuration of what you can redeploy 
from other pre-existing resources. And here is where like some of the ideas around capability life cycles, how they go through the founding, development, and maturity really come front and center in our thinking about uh, like resources and capabilities. And of course, going back to what I suggested from Nelson and Venter, this idea that resources underpin subsequent path dependent evolution within firms have again been very important and we have several studies around persistence and cumulativeness of ways in which firms do business is really the core source of it goes to these internal possessions that they have and sometimes these are good because they allow you to pursue certain paths that are open up avenues for investment. Other times they turn into core rigidities, perhaps becoming a source of problem, but there is that continuity and persistence. And finally, as much as firms may have resources, capabilities under their possession, these are not modular. You have to think about how to configure them, how to reconfigure them, and how to renew them. And going back to uh, Samina and Laurence's uh, review of this literature, think about how to add, redeploy, and recombine or divest resources in this process. So as you'll see, like I've been drawing on a number of paper, probably a very, very incomplete list of references here in this overview, strategic management scholars have given a lot of thought to different attributes of resources and capability and their connection to competitive advantage. And now I invite our panelists to really like open some of these ideas up. This was a very uh, high level overview and I hope they can open some of these up. Uh, we'll start with uh, Connie Hoffett. Connie, please. All right, hey everyone. It's just great to see everyone here. Um, Maka did a great overview. Um, I'm actually going to overlap a little bit with what she did. Um, so I think part of what I want to do is set the stage for the other panelists. Um, but let me go ahead and share my screen, first of all, before we go too much further. Uh, so hang on a second. Uh, all right. Hang on a second. Okay. All right, so hopefully you can all see this. Um, so, all right, uh, past, present, and future resources and capabilities. That's kind of a lot to talk about in, I think I have 10 to 12 minutes. So um, let me first say, um, you know, this is a huge literature, right? And uh, given that so many of you view this as your home literature, um, I think um, I just want to orient the discussion um, about with, some definitions, so at least you understand how I think about them. I'm really briefly going to talk about some foundational contributions because Maka did a great job. And then I want to talk a little bit about a subject that I'm particularly interested in and have been interested in for a long time, which is the evolution of capabilities. And then at the end of my few minutes here, I just want to talk a little bit about um, some new research that is you know, that I'm seeing and um, where we might go with it. So without further ado, here's how I define these things, right? What's a resource, right? So narrowly defined, it's an asset of some type, tangible, intangible, and human that's owned or controlled by an organization. I mean, it is true the literature sometimes uses the word resources very broadly. Even if you go back to Jay Barney's early work, I mean, he included any attribute of the organization as a resource, which, um, so I think this is one reason why I think uh, definitions are useful, uh, you know, whenever you talk or write to say, here's what I mean. And then a capability, what's that? People, oh my gosh, the number of things have been written about what is or isn't a capability and what's the problems with the term. So here's my definition. It's the capacity to perform an activity on a repeated and reliable basis in concert with the deployment of resources. And that, you know, Maka said, you know, they can be at the organization level that compose of routines, procedures, processes, but I've argued that individuals also have capabilities that matter for strategic management. And uh, I've suggested that a starting point would be to think about individuals, human capital, the social capital they bring with them and their cognition. So for today, these are my definitions. Um, 
So here's the literature. The way I think about it is I think about sort of the base theoretical literature that started with Berger, Wernerfeld, and Rimmel and Barney that sort of said, hey, we really need to be thinking about these internal assets of the firms and why they might matter for competitive advantage. Uh, you know, in contrast to, I think, what was the reigning view that you all know, which was sort of thinking of it more from in point of view of industry competition. And then there were sort of three, I think, foundational pieces, you know, several years later, Mahoney and Pandy and Margie Petteroff and Amit and Shoemaker that sort of filled this out. So I think that's one stream. And then the, the other stream, and, and Maka talked about this, is I think there's a big application of this to corporate scope, right? So that's where Penrose came in and Montgomery and Werner Feltz, wonderful Rand Journal article. If you haven't read it, it's amazing still today. Um, and then there's a, a somewhat different stream of research on capabilities. Uh, and you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the dynamic capabilities literature, and I just put a few sites up there. But you know, Sid Winter distinguished between dynamic capabilities and what he called operational or ordinary capabilities, which the best way I think to characterize them would be non-dynamic, right? So a dynamic capability, it's not a capability that changes itself, all right? There's, there's a lot of confusion. It's a capability for changing other capabilities. An operational or an ordinary capability is a capability to, to sort of maintain the status quo. And that by itself is not so easy, right? And so I think that's why Sid differentiated with them. And in Nelson and Winter, even though that was a theory of economic change, if you read how they talked about routines and capabilities, they, they are talking about both operational you know, capabilities to keep going and some sense of change. But that's where I think the idea for operational ordinary capabilities comes from. Um, Okay, so having said that, I'm sure you all know, here's a whole bunch of application areas, right? So I tried to think, you know, where do we see these most, right? I think you see it in the corporate scope literature. Uh, I think more recent literature that Maka talked about is firm reconfiguration. I'm gonna, you, you see it in the notion of industry evolution, particularly as firms come into industries with different resources, how does that, cause industry to evolve. I think mm, a lot of people think that knowledge is an asset of the firm. So that's the link to the knowledge base view. Clearly technological innovation, factor markets going back to Jay's work. Strategic HR is a huge area for resources and capabilities. And I think that's been coming on lately. Entrepreneurship, international business. And then I wanted to flag that there are really substantial literatures on resources that are outside of management, right? They're in the marketing literature, right? They're in operations and information technology. So um, it's pretty amazing actually. And, you know, even though the antecedents of some of this, you know, come from outside strategy with Penrose and Nelson and Winter initially, I think front and center, the RBV, is, and dynamic capabilities are homegrown strategy theories, right? And that is one thing that absolutely differentiates them. Um, so having said, said that, I like to talk a little bit about capabilities. As most of you know, I've spent a lot of my career thinking about capabilities. So I thought maybe I'd tell you why I've done that. Why do I think this matters, right? So flat out, I think it's really hard to obtain an advantage from resources unless you're just lucky without a capability, right? I mean, look, if you give me, um, you know, a car to fix, you know, say here, this car is broken, fix it. You know, I'm going to give you some tools. Here are your resources, right? Uh, uh, believe me, it wouldn't happen, right? Why? Because I have no capability for fixing the car. All right, I, I can actually check my tire pressure. That, that's pretty good. I can check the oil, but I could actually not repair a car, right? So I think this is why capabilities matter, right? Um, resources are not enough. Uh, what do capabilities do? Well, they, you know, this comes out of literature, they confer a reliable and repeated way to find, create, and leverage resources. 
right? So, and, and I will say here that some firms have more effective capabilities than others, right? So just because you can do something reliably and repeatedly doesn't mean you do it well, right? You know, if you have a capability for, you know, I love this example, you know, <laughs> assembling a car, uh, it doesn't mean that car is like, you know, really good, right? So some, some firms have better capabilities than others. Um, I think most of the research on capabilities actually focuses on their use, their application, and the outcomes of this application, right? And the thing is, is that I think even though Maka said, well, there's research on the antecedents to capabilities, my sense of the literature is that this is a much smaller part of the literature. You know, how do firms companies, organizations obtain capabilities before they can use them, right? And so um, that's why I'm interested in the evolution of capabilities, right? Because what, what makes capabilities so interesting is you can't buy them, right? You have to build them, right? Unless you buy an entire firm that's already built the capabilities, right? So how do you do this? And we, and we know at a sort of a basic level that capabilities are built through learning, Organizational learning and individual learning is not so easy, right? Um, I, I've proposed, along with Margie Petteroff, that we think capabilities evolve over time. And, and Maka, you know, alluded to this, right? Um, I almost put a picture up here of the capability life cycle, but decided not to. I mean, you know, it's not just that they are sort of born, you know, they grow, they mature, but they branch, right? Which is, I think, then you get to a lot of the things that people are interested in, they branch by going to other businesses, so you diversify. They branch by replicating. They branch by dying, right, being retired. Um, and, and one thing that's important is this evolution, yes, it involves learning, but it involves more than learning, right? Um, and I think in particular that strategic actions and decisions shape the direction of learning and they shape the evolution of capabilities. So if you think about M&A, right, we also think a lot of time we think of, of mergers and acquisitions as an outcome of capabilities, right? You have a capability to do a merger and acquisition. Some firms can do this better than others. So the outcome of the merger might be better if you have a better capability. But another way to think about this is when you do a merger, it's going to shape the capabilities. Like some of Will Mitchell's early work was with Laurence was about this, you know, the reconfiguration of capabilities after a merger, right? What happens, right? So I, I think that that's actually something that's been underexplored. Right, strategy can change capabilities, not just capabilities affecting a strategy. Yeah. Okay, so you know this is something I've always been interested in. So here's a research opportunity for anyone who might be interested, which is that we could trace the development and change of capabilities within firms over time. And you know there are some case studies that have done this, um, but. You know, what I'd love to see are what I call capability development maps, right? Could you take similarly situated firms, you know, trace the development change of their capabilities and their effects on proximate outcomes, that is immediate outcome of the capability, the performance of the firm, what happened to the external environment, did it have any effect on the external environment? I, I think we do this... Um, very rarely, actually. And I'd love to see more of it. Be and you could do this both qualitative research and quantitative, trying to measure some of this. Uh, so I think it would be enlightening. We would, this is something we really haven't done. Um, so let me just say a few words before I end here, it's sort of some things about newer research. Where do I see some newer research? Of course, you guys are all doing this work, so you tell me. But I think clearly there's an opportunity in platforms and ecosystems to think more about this and digital technologies more generally, AI, it's a new context. Um, there's more theory coming out on value creation and capture. Stakeholders is a big issue. I mean, Jay Barney's been writing about this and Bob Hoskinson. And I think also thanks to Arkady Sakratov, he's really been carrying the resource redeployment flag. And then empirical work, where do I see new empirical work? I think people are starting to look at complementary versus substitute resources, right? You know, what happens? How do they interact? And also, I think the general point about resource reconfiguration that Maka talked about is a big issue. 
So just um, some free advertising here as I close. Um, so SMJ has a special issue coming out on new directions for the RBV. Uh, Asim is one of the special issue editors uh, along, you know, on this. And, um, and um, the papers are online. Uh, it probably won't be coming out um, in print, quote, uh, for some months. But I just wanted to see the topics, right? I, these are not the titles of the papers. These are my paraphrasing of the titles. But you've got digital firms and, you know, the issue of scaling quickly. You have AI and complements and substitutes. Again, more complements and substitutes and interdependence of workflows. You've got stakeholders and how do we think about this as well as value creation and capture. Also uncertainty and value-based strategy. And then going back to sort of some roots, you know, how do we find these resources and what happens when they decay? So with that, let me stop sharing and turn this over to the next person. Okay, which I think is me. Uh, so um, thanks, uh, thanks to Maka and to Heather and to the STR division for organizing um, not just this session, but I think the entire series. It's been really fun to see, uh, you know, these nice distillations of these complicated ideas into sort of basic uh, fundamentals. Uh, and <laughs> I know I've been using them for my PhD students, so that's been great. Uh, and of course, uh, also for uh, inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel to talk about uh, RBV. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, go ahead and share my screen here and hopefully you can all see that and, and also see, uh, and I'm just gonna put that in. Okay, hopefully you can now see it in, uh, in presentation mode. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I, I knew Connie was gonna do an amazing job of kind of talking about uh, resources and capabilities within the firm. So I thought I'd take a slightly different tack, maybe focusing a little bit more on the role of markets when it comes to capabilities and resources, because that's really where a lot of my interest in thinking about comparative governance uh, sort of fit in. Uh, and so um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, and I, I guess let me, before I start, let me uh, put in two caveats, right? One, I'm going to use the term resources here in the in a much broader sense than Connie was talking about. So I'm going to use them in the sense of including capabilities, and I'm not going to make distinctions between resources and capabilities, which is not. I mean, I totally agree with Connie that I think those that distinction is important, but I think it's also uh, it just makes my slides too crowded to see resources and capabilities, and I don't really want to make that distinction. Um, I'm also going to say, you know, obviously in talking about a, a large body of work like this, I'm going to cite some people, but I'm sure there's many, many other people I'm going to end up not citing. And I apologize in advance if you are one of those people, because I, I, you know, I think it's impossible to put everything on a slide without making it a complete eye chart. Uh, okay, so um, sort of going back to fundamentals and thinking about markets, right? So a fundamental question for RBV right from the beginning has been kind of how do we, what is it that drives the wedge between value creation and value capture, right? It's, uh, uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient for these resources and capabilities to allow you to achieve superior performance. If it's going to be a basis of economic rents, if it's gonna be a basis of comparative advantage, it must be the case that those rents, are th that value is not competed away in the marketplace. So there have to be some ex ante and ex post limits to competition, which is something you know, again, very much front and center in some of this early work by Barney and, and Margie. And essentially the question can be sort of, you can think about that as a question of why is it that the costs of acquiring uh, and, and acute or developing this resource is less than value in use. And also the separate but related question of why is it that even if you could acquire it for less, so even if it costs you less than, than its use value, why is it that you have to keep owning it to get the value? Why can't you just sell it to somebody else uh, and realize the value that way, right? So there has to be an opportunity cost of owning a resource that has to be less than its value in use. Um, and I'm gonna suggest that there are really two answers to that um, or two sets of answers to that. So I think one set of answers to that question really focuses on this kind of what I'm gonna call uh, somewhat historically uh, the neoclassical view, right? Which really thinks about these fictions and strategic factor markets, also known as isolating mechanisms in romance work, ways in which the market for these resources do, does not work 
which makes it important for firms to kind of hold on to these resources and operate them themselves. And that can be partially about kind of various types of information asymmetry. So for some reason, some people understand the value of this resource and others don't, or you know, uh, are able to sort of you know, predict it ahead of time versus not. Uh, it could be various kinds of co-specialization or complementarity. So we already have some resources that mean that we have heterogeneous uses from resources that others don't, or it could be some form of knowledge stickiness, tacitness, social embeddedness, which says, well, this thing can't really exist outside of the firm. We can't just trade it. Uh, it has to be held within the firm. Uh, I would add parenthetically that this is also, I know we're doing a next session on transaction cost economics, but this is also in some sense, the connection between uh, the notion of strategic resources and, and transaction cost economics, because of course, frictions and strategic factor markets are nothing other than transaction costs. And so it turns out that, you know, if you think about the firm being required to make investments in these, in these specialized investments, a la Williamson, those specialized investments turn out to be in precisely the resources and capabilities that are strategic in the sense that they give you um, uh, uh, comparative advantage. So, and, and again, this is a point that several people have made over, over the years, um, but I call this the neoclassical view because if you think about how we think about resources in this view, we're thinking about resources as things that have very clearly, you know, there's a clearly a specific use or a specific menu of uses that we can put these resources to. We know what the value or at least the expected value of that uses so we can calculate some sort of probabilistic value of the resource in its use. And then firms just become the sort of repository. So we essentially, they're kind of almost historical uh, artifacts of the fact that we somehow acquired this resource at a cost less than its value of use. And then we're just going to hold on to this resource. And as Mark has said, you know, sort of put a fence around it. Uh, and then strategy really becomes about identifying, finding, and acquiring these kind of VRI resources. So, I mean, the picture I have here is of Indiana Jones, right? So it's kind of this, we're gonna go out there and find this resource that's kind of hidden away in some deep dark forest and we'll acquire it. And then it, we know it's gonna be valuable. We just have to figure out how to get it without kind of falling down a hole or getting stabbed by a bunch of arrows or whatever else, right? Um, or ideally avoiding snakes entirely. Um, in contrast, I would put, you know, a more evolutionary Austrian view of thinking about resource acquisition or even actually capability development as really a process of a kind of entrepreneurial process of discovering or creating the value, right? So uh, I think the evolutionary part of this is really the idea that it's not like resources, there is no menu of uses, right? Every resource is capable of an infinite set of resources. We can recombine them endlessly to kind of find new ways and we're constantly discovering new uses of resources. Uh, and this notion that we can somehow kind of completely specify the use of resources, which Daniel Fang and Winter call exhaustive entrepreneurship, simply does not, is not possible, right? So we have, and again, I think this is very close to the spirit of Penrose because Penrose is really thinking about firms kind of constantly identifying new areas of growth, finding new uses for resources. Uh, and and so, so that's the kind of evolutionary side of this. Uh, and then the Austrian side of this is that these resources uses are fundamentally uncertain, right? How do you know what a resource is worth or a capability is worth, uh, what the use of a capability or resource is worth until you've actually used it? Uh, so you can't actually tell ex ante what the value is going to be. And if that's the case, then this whole problem of sort of ex ante price discovery and the need for um, uh, frictions in the market for ex ante resources goes away because uh, there is no market for subjective entrepreneurial judgment. You have a subjective view of what this capability can do. You go ahead and develop it and you discover what it's actually worth. And then you get the value of that as rescue claims, right? And so, uh, so we basically then, so what that does is it turns, uh, it turns into a much more of a sort of, uh, it turns the resource story much more into a notion of saying, well, we don't know what these resources are going to be about ex ante, Firms then become more like engines for reshaping resources, right? So we're going to constantly try to find better ways of using our resources, better uses of this capability. Uh, and, and its strategy becomes really about recombining and reusing existing resources to create and capture maximum value. So I have a somewhat dated reference to MacGyver here, or at least the old version of MacGyver. And I realized there's a new version of MacGyver, much to my horror, um, but talking about recycling resources. But 
right? It's this idea that, you know, you give a, give me a paper clip and you give me a couple of rubber bands and that's not worth very much by itself, but then I have the quote unquote capability to develop that into something with which I can steer a nuclear device or like, you know, I don't know, disarm all of like, Ukraine or something, right? So, anyway, um, so so that's really I think the the notion of resources that personally is much closer to sort of my own interests and certainly more the notion of resources that I think of, uh, which is again I think very much a story about the dynamics of resources, even though it is not to go back to Connie's point a story about dynamic capabilities, right? So it's not that these resources themselves or these capabilities themselves are dynamic. It's that they are constantly in flux and constantly being reshaped to potentially a dynamic capability, but not necessarily to a dynamic capability to allow us to find new opportunities. I will say that this, this kind of notion of, you know, we always have a set of resource owners and we're always trying to sort of bargain with them, figure out what the ex ante payments to be when sharing value with them also connects to, uh, as, as Connie mentioned, a more recent set of work on stakeholder theory which starts to say, well, okay, it's not like we kind of always own these resources. Often these resources are owned by other people. Often we have to convince them to modify them in certain ways to maximize value creation. And we can think about how does that value sharing occur in a way that looks very much like stakeholder management. Um, so thinking about, continuing to think about this perspective where we're constantly thinking about how do we reuse and recombine resources uh, you know, obviously there are ways of doing that within the firm. Uh, and, you know, Connie already talked about much of this, so I'm not going to go over it again, except to say, you know, I think there's some really exciting work being done on resource reconfiguration, but also I think increasingly on organizational shaping, right? So not just the idea that we can find new uses for, we can change the resources to get them to do new things, but also that we can take the resources we have and make the uses they can be put to more valuable and more important by shaping what the market cares about. Uh, but I think the but the point I want to emphasize though is it's not just about doing this within the firm. So with apologies to to uh, uh, Lawrence and Capron, right? So they have this lovely book on build, borrow, and buy, which is about how do you actually acquire the resources that you are capabilities you need to fill the gaps you have. Uh, I'm going to think about it as build, lend, sell, or spawn. So build is all the stuff you do within the organization to kind of develop resources and reuse capabilities and resources internally. We can think about lending resources to others and capabilities to others, right? So we have a long tradition of sort of the relationship-based view going back to Dyer and Singh, which says you don't need to own a resource or capability to have access to it and be able to use it to create value uh, and to create and capture value. We have a long literature on alliances and other kinds of relationship-based contracting, which says, well, again, you can kind of come together with other firms and use your resources together. So again, you don't need to own a resource to have access to it. And then I think more uh, recently, we've got a you know, large and growing literature thinking about things like standard setting platforms and ecosystems, all of which in some sense come back to saying, look, we've created this resource. Uh, you have another resource or a set of resources that are complementary to what we've got. Uh, we can put these together and create value and agree on some way of sharing that value ex ante that allows us to operate. So we end up with this it doesn't, it's not being done within the firm, but it's still the notion of we have to be able to identify the critical, critical or in, uh, in Jacobides at all work bottleneck resources and think about how those actually create value and how do we ex ante sort of identify those resources, share the value with them and constantly keep, uh, keep those resources evolving. Um, we have a, a we have a big literature on uh, selling resources, right? So once you, you don't have to, it's not always the case that resources cannot be sold or even capabilities cannot be sold. You have uh, a lot of things where you can talk about markets. So obviously we have a long, long literature on markets for technology going back to peace and profiting from innovation. Uh, Connie mentioned this briefly, but I think we have a fascinating literature on strategic human capital because obviously you, know, you can't really own uh, human capital, but you can manage it to ensure that you're both able to kind of maximize value creation and capture. And I think some absolutely brilliant work by Raskov and Campbell, David Krasinski, Seth Conahan, many, many others kind of thinking about this huge and growing area of research. And then I think you have a big literature in markets, for, uh, an original literature in markets for corporate control, which thinks about how do we actually acquire resources from others and capabilities from others, and then reconfigure them or, or use them, right? So again, a lot of the Capron and Mitchell work in the context of acquisitions, uh, but also I would say a lot of new work that's starting to think about markets for corporate ownership. So, uh, 
I'm going to put in a plug for my PhD student, my former PhD student, Paul Nari, who's now at Wharton, uh, who's been doing, I think, some really cool work thinking about how private equity firms can help enable shifts in ownership. So once you're no longer the best owner for a resource, how do we actually, for corporate, for business, how do we actually reconfigure that and, and find you a better owner? And then finally, there's, I think, a big literature on spawning, right? So a lot of the resources and capabilities and knowledge that firms develop actually end up seeding new industries, new markets uh, uh, to entrepreneurial spin-outs, uh, obviously going back to the seminal work by Steve Klepper, but also work by Vajri, by Martin Ganko, others, uh, huge literature on geographic spillovers, right? So this knowledge kind of spilling over into the local areas and how that actually impacts innovation, uh, including, you know, work by Heather uh, and many other people. And this kind of notion uh, in Agarwal, Advesh, and Sarkar of creative construction. So again, we can think about uh, these, these resources and capabilities in a much broader frame than thinking about them just within the firm. So just to close, and I don't know how I'm doing a time, but just to close, I think the main thing I want you to take away here is without even touching on dynamic capabilities and dynamic resources, I think resource dynamics are very interesting. And I think thinking about resources, not as these things that you own and keep in your firm kind of locked away in a secret vault, like Coke's secret formula, because you're going to use it again and again, but thinking of them as these living entities that are constantly sort of evolving to take the capability life cycle metaphor, uh, and that are being shaped uh, within the organization. Uh, so there's this constant sort of entrepreneurial process of reshaping and evolving resources and adapting resources. Uh, and so I think that's really, to me, where a lot of the excitement in the new RBV stories goes. And I think a lot of that also comes down to saying we have to understand that that flow happens both within firms and understanding that flow within firms is really exciting but also thinking about the flow across firms and thinking about how you know, we're constantly sort of moving resources and capabilities from one firm to the other, whether it's through acquisitions, whether it's through markets for information, whether it's all kinds of ways in which we kind of constantly shift these resources from one firm to the other, that I think is really exciting. And then I think we've only started to scratch the surface of understanding. So I'm gonna stop there uh, with again, my thanks to, to, to everyone for being here. Uh, I think there's about 95 of you on this call at this moment, and that's that's really wonderful, wonderful to see. So thanks. And I'm going to pass it on to, uh, I think, Kathy's next. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my screen here to show what I need it to show. There we go. Well, thank you all for being here. As it seems said, there's an awful lot of folks who've, uh, who've joined us here for this, this uh, discussion. I'm gonna take a slightly different approach. I'm gonna talk about resource allocation, bridging resource and capabilities perspectives on strategy with work on resource allocation. So looking at sort of an application and, and bringing some literatures, literatures together. And, you know, we, we know resource allocation, it, it, it goes back to some of the, you know, classic conceptualizations of strategy that a lot of resource allocation embedded in them in some way. Um, when you're talking about Chandler's definition, Hofer and Schendel, and so all this, you know, there's some sort of resource budget. There's resource allocation strategies help allocating resources. And in a in a special issue of SMJ, but going back to 1991, um, Dick Meltan, Schendel, and David Teese were contrasting strategic management and and economics. And the the main distinction was economics. You know, as conceived at the time, um, concerned with allocation, coordination, resources, via markets, strategic management, it's inside the firm. So these classic views on strategic management have you know, resource allocation is is at uh, at its heart. So I start thinking about how we use resources in research. The whole concept of resources. You know, are we talking about inputs to productive activity? Or are we talking about a concept of resources that has some very specific theoretical arguments attached to it? Uh, 
you know, resource dependence theory is an example. Not what we're talking about here, though I saw in the chat, uh, Chavia Castagne posed a, a question in the chat, said, what about resource dependence theory uh, with reference to something that was, was said? But that's a use of resources with some very specific theoretical arguments to address particular issues. What we're talking about here today is, is within this realm of resource-based and capability theories. You know, as, as Connie started uh, with her discussion of some of the background or Maka's uh, introduction, it's not just productive inputs, factor inputs, it's these inputs, but then there's some, some theoretical arguments that have to do with their nature and how they're used and what creates value. And I think it's a really important distinction to think about, are we, are we talking about resources just almost dictionary definition sense or just as economic inputs or is it packaged with some arguments and it reminds me of a of a of a session an sms session many years ago i was i was in a session uh, with margie petteroff she and i were, were presenting something and it had to do with with capabilities dynamic capabilities and a very senior scholar who works in a very different tradition just interrupted us and said why do we need all these concepts and arguments we need resources and processes. That's all we need. Just put those two together. We don't need anything else. And you know, of course, we had these you know very clever arguments coming back to him. But it makes you think about it. Just talking about resources, different folks are using it in different ways in their research and in their making these these arguments. A lot of economic arguments. So I think we want to be very clear about whether we are using the concept in conjunction with theoretical arguments about relationships. And what I'm thinking about here right now is, is taking some of these resource and capability theories, the concept and their arguments, and bridging it with work on resource allocation. Because very often work in resource allocation is very common to just treat it as an input to productive activity. And you know, there's resources and they have to get allocated. But I think there's a lot of opportunities for resource allocation research to take resource based and capability theories along with their arguments, not just the concept of resources. Because you know, RBV and other resource based theories, they offer concepts, language, they let us connect resource allocation with value creation, competitive advantage, and some of those things that we, we, we care about in, in strategy. And if we think about resource allocation research, and there's, I recognize some folks in uh, that's joined us today who, who do work in this tradition of resource allocation. Um, many of you may, may not, but essentially much of the research, uh, this is a very broad uh, characterization here, but they tend to fall in buckets like process models that emphasize decision-making. So it's all about how these decisions are made about what to do with, with resources. Or there's other work that's looking at capital in particular, capital allocation, and there's a focus on efficiency. Is the capital being allocated efficiently in, in a firm? So we have these, these, these bodies of research, but they're just looking at these resources, these factor inputs, and how they are, how they're distributed in the firm. Well, I think we can do a little bit more with characterizing these by drawing on resource-based theories. You start asking, okay, what's getting allocated? Are they financial resources? Are they non-financial resources? Both of them together in conjunction with each other? Because we, not, we know a lot about the consequences of resource characteristics from RBB work and work on, on, on capabilities. You know, whether you're talking about the BRIO resources, BRIN resources, whether we are looking at uh, commodity versus specialized, are they bundled, are they co-specialized, are there isolating mechanisms associated with it? We know a lot about these sort of consequences of, of resource characteristics. So we can think about the nature of the resources that are being allocated. And can that tell us something about the processes that are used? Does it help inform the processes, make better decision processes? Does it help us understand um, the, uh, the we're looking at, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. When we're thinking about the financial resources, the, the efficiency of financial capital allocation, well, what's that capital getting spent on? What is being used for in competitive terms? And how can we use a resource-based lens to think about 
this, these non-financial resources that the financial resources are being converted into and then deployed in the firm. And thinking about the characteristics of those non-financial resources, it allows us to make that link between there's money being spent, money being allocated, and then what happens eventually in terms of how the firm uses those resources. And then finally, if we're talking about the non-financial resources, are they allocated within a unit, across units? Some of the issues that, that Connie touched on uh, a little bit earlier, you know, resources being redeployed, uh, are resources being shared? And thinking about the, how value is created from resources, some of the, 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 the um, Montgomery and Wernerfeld work that, that, that was uh, mentioned earlier, about resources in these multi-business firms and how value can be created from that and tying that to these allocation decisions. And when we think about allocating even capital across businesses, allocating non-financial resources across businesses, there's a lot of connections we can start thinking about making. So if we wanna then, you know, I've been thinking a lot about resource allocation within RBB research. So not just how an RBB lens can inform resource allocation research, but where does ideas of resource allocation fit within um, resource research? And you know, we, we have the sort of that some of that foundational work looking at outcomes of heterogeneous resource positions, you know, the ties to performance, where a lot of the foundational work was focused. We also have then there was early work about the origins of heterogeneous resource positions. Uh, you know, Jay Barney's early strategic factor market work, Derricks and Cool on asset accumulation. Uh, and then more recently, well, it's not so recent any, anymore, but, but a little bit later, attention redevoted to origins of the, some of the factor market work Rich McAdock was, was doing um, that increased emphasis there. But then there's this other work that is about managing heterogeneous resource positions. And there's been sort of increased interest over time in looking at that. It's not the origins and it's not the outcomes, but how are these resource positions managed? And you know, I see research on resource allocation can fitting very nicely sort of in these first two. Because if we think about um, the origins, you know, strategic factor market work, work on asset accumulation. But then there's resource allocation. We can look at how you know, investing financial capital in buying or building other resources. And that can fit this conversation on the origins of the resource positions quite, quite nicely. But then other work on resource allocation, I think the, the, this is really where a lot of it can belong here. We think about managing the heterogeneous resort positions. You have the asset orchestration work, David Teese's work on orchestration, the resource management work that David Sermon and others have done. Um, the work on resource redeployment would be in here too. So managing these heterogeneous positions and, and how they may be changing over time, how they may be evolving over time. And thinking about the role of resource allocation decisions in here, whether it is investing financial resources to um, alter the resources that, that, uh, that a firm has, or to acquire some new ones that are then bundled with some of these other resources the firm has. Investing in maintaining the status quo, when you're talking about investing in these capabilities, even just what has to be done to maintain what you're doing. So there, there I think is a real role for looking at resource allocation as a distinct managerial activity and how it contributes to um, these heterogeneous resource positions. So I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna leave it there, but just sort of throwing those ideas out there as we think about bridging um, resource-based theories with other research and strategy and some areas that might have some, some real promise. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Ralph is probably going to be providing uh, another, another kind of bridge between resources and uh, other research. So I will leave it there. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so given that uh, I was going last after such a 
distinguished panel. I wasn't quite sure what to talk about, but so I made sure to include many, many pictures um, because that's apparently what you can do to get some attention again. Diverted from the context, focus them on the picture. So um, thanks again for, for having me and for being able to, to speak on this panel, which, which is, an, is an honor. Um, so as, as sorry, Casey just indicated, I wanted to talk a bit about more the connection of resource-based viewing capabilities views uh, with other areas, um, because that's kind of where I was coming from and, and where my uh, interest uh, lies in. So my background isn't the resource-based view. That's how I started research. Well, I technically started research on brand equity and uh, didn't like the topic. Then my supervisor, I asked my supervisor, why did he actually accept me to do research on brand equity if he actually has never done anything in branding? And he says, yeah, in the introduction, you had a sentence that says human resources are the most important resource in the firm that links to the resource base. And I really like the resource base. So that, that's how a PhD journey can also start with starting something completely different. Um, and I link the, uh, the resource base view and dynamic capabilities view to innovation and, and co-creation research for mar uh, marketing. And the interesting part is when I started preparing for this, uh, I wanted to see like four, and I know that there are other articles that might have been very highly influential, but I started just with, with those four articles and I just wanted to see, okay, um, and this is not a very, very detailed uh, literature review, of course, so please uh, um, apologize for that, but I kind of wanted to see in which areas um, have they been cited, and you can see that they have been cited in many, many journals from across areas, so not only strategy management, marketing, um, to innovation, to IT, and, and I think this is where well, I was uh, probably invited by, by Marco to kind of give a bit of an idea of maybe how you can, uh, with the capability research uh, more broadly and resources research has been used in other areas. Um, also, it was interesting to see if I just, again, look at the absolute raw numbers of where research on capabilities, so I just looked for the two keyword capabilities in keyword, uh, title, abstract, and, and uh, keywords. Um, yeah, of course, they are in the core management journals um, or management journals, uh, of course, a lot in strategic management journal, but also in marketing and uh, two of the main marketing journals and two of the main innovation journals. There's a lot of research that uses the capabilities lens. lens. And this is, um, I thought, quite interesting to see that, you know, it's not um, only in the core area when, when you go back a bit to when, when we read the article by Wernerfeld and Barney, um, starting with diversification and maybe multinational enterprises even to just go away that it has been applied in in very different areas and that's where i then uh, came in um, a few years ago and wanted to understand together with other authors um the dynamic capabilities view and what could we continue doing what research was missing so that's now about six years ago but um we really wanted to go through and do a quite intense effort to not only have our opinion um, um, represented, but we actually had uh, round tables with authors um, of our sample set at the uh, AOM meeting, but also at the SMS conference. We wanted to see where they think the resource based uh, dynamic capabilities view is going. And uh, I want to build on this a bit, how that influenced my research, but also other research that I can see um, and what topics have surely been missing and what I think is interesting to continue work on and, and what is uh, emerging in these areas. Because one thing that I think we, we still uh, struggle a bit with is, is trying to understand, for example, in dynamic capabilities, the multi-level phenomenon. And yes, we have the construct of dynamic managerial capabilities where we look very much in the individual. Uh, a lot of that is looking at the manager and how the manager um, makes decisions uh, possibly in, in for example, research allocation decisions. On the other hand, there are a lot of other players uh, in organizations on the individual level that influence um, change, innovation, and the use of dynamic capabilities. Um, so there's research coming up that looks more in the roles of middle managers, for example, instead of senior management. Um, there's also some research has started to emerge, which looks at non-managerial employees um, and how they might, with their set of dynamic manager capabilities, um, linked to organizational citizenship behavior, going above and beyond what you are expected uh, to do, how they might positively or negatively affect dynamic capabilities. Now, what back then wasn't as much big of a topic and, and therefore we actually didn't discuss as much on the round tables and also in the survey, which doesn't come up, but interestingly, there's no research more and more emerging on it, is of course the phenomenon of, of ecosystems and how resources and dynamic capabilities might affect in that context and research that um, someone in the round tables, I remember uh, very strongly said is a topic that we need to talk more about is teams 
And within teams, um, the discussion was around how the dynamic capabilities, for example, emerge in innovation teams, how they therefore might affect um, organizational strategy and behavior, but also in senior leadership teams I might it with, be within the name, um, the TMT, because a lot of DMC research focuses just on, for example, the CEO, one person, but rather than how does the shared dynamic managerial capabilities within the top management team might affect decision making, or on the other hand, and um, for those who like to look at the intersection between the board of directors and the top management team, um, how their distinct and separate set of dynamic managerial capabilities might, uh, might have an effect on, on um, overall firm dynamic capabilities um, in innovation and change. So the interesting thing is what I think moving forward is, is which uh, hasn't been done a, as much so far is actually the idea of, of, of platforms and ecosystems and how um, the idea of what we have learned in the resource-based view or in the dynamic capabilities view might need to be extended or adjusted. So this is um, a project that, that we did a literature review on the sharing economy, and we, we tried to uh, focus on or using a, an idea of uh, business models. And when you look at business models, and, and we're not the first one to talk about this, but who owns resources, who owns capabilities, how change is happening in ecosystems or in platform ecosystems uh, is changing and has changed. Uh, we know that uh, human resources, which was mentioned as being in one of the uh, crucial um, factors uh, for organizations, um, they're not often em employed by firms like Uber, Airbnb, and so any, uh, much anymore. We know the phenomenon of multi-homing. So how do we actually uh, make sure that these resources um, are, are important? Now, you could say they don't fulfill the valuable, rare, inimitable, non-substitutable criteria anyway. On the flip side, we have learned that um, in Australia, where we had the borders closed for more than two years, or about two years, uh, one and a half years, um, we are now very much um, lacking human resources on all levels. Might it be just in, in, in uh, jobs like Uber or food delivery, um, but at the same time also in, in very uh, crucial positions, if it's in consulting, market research, uh, mining, and, and other uh, skills. So those possibly outsourced skills might have now become actually part of, of your business model in a way that they become, if you don't have them, uh, a critical uh, deficit. So how do you therefore structure um, um, the value capture and value creation aspect, which we talk about in business models and often have a very firm centric view. If we now know that there are a lot of other players involved that contribute their resources, share resources, they have their own definition of what, what value creation, what value capture means. And yes, there might be a central player, but there might be not. So I think this is a, a discussion on, on how the idea of the resource based view might need to be, be um, okay, there's potential to extend that a bit more. Similarly, when we talk about dynamic capabilities at the ecosystem, so there is an increase in research, for example, also by Connie that talked about um, dynamic capabilities and ecosystems. Um, there's also research in innovation and, and also in, a bit in marketing. But the point is, is that, um, that, that they often have focused thus far on, on the, uh, a dominant firm or a, a, the lead firm in an ecosystem or that the platform leader that created the platform. But the question is now, given that we, we, we have a more holistic understanding of ecosystems and how does actually, how do these other players possibly contribute to um, change or shaping in a market? Um, so a project uh, that we've worked on in healthcare ecosystems, uh, for example, where we try to really understand and how change and shaping within an ecosystem is happening if you don't have a lead organization, if you don't have a player that is actually reaping the majority of the reward. And here there was um, healthcare ecosystems where uh, there, there is an invisible hand, so to speak, a government organization that has some funding, but thus has no control of the other players and actually has also no, no direct contact with patients and has no, um, will not generate any profit and how they basically um, coordinate the ecosystem in the seizing, contributing their resources, trying to create shared value propositions, shared uh, governance um, of the ecosystem, and therefore ultimately come up with new solutions um, to patient care and ultimately to societal uh, health and creating value for the overall society more so than for the individual organization. So again, trying to understand and how possibly the dynamic capabilities are not owned uh, or fully relied on an individual player, a dominant player, but maybe many players in, a, in the wider ecosystem. I think it's there's a lot of research trying um, that moving forward that could benefit here. And I started off with saying 
that um, linking more these areas of, of, for example, marketing and innovation, and therefore the core strategy, resource-based view, and dynamic capability research is, is, is huge potential. Um, part of that is because when I did literature reviews in the areas, one in marketing, one in, in innovation, and, and one in uh, strategy, dynamic capabilities, we could see that they don't really cite each other very much. And I know that's not, I'm not the first one to say that, and that's a, it's an open phenomena. But I think in, in this case, and it was mentioned now, I think by all presenters, um, the idea of shaping research and how dynamic capabilities, for example, can be used to shape markets. And the interesting part is when you, when you look into this, there's a lot of research um, published in marketing journals, and there's a lot of research published in strategy journals. Not, not all of the research and strategy, of course, relies on dynamic capabilities, but the phenomenon of shaping lends itself very much to using a dynamic capability resource based lens, um, depending on what level you, you look in, into that as well. Um, and to see, again, this is a strategy audience, there's um, research uh, in, in, in the Journal of Academy of Marketing Science, for example, that has used integrated market thinking, which is uh, inherently a marketing construct. They, they approach it from a marketing point of view. And marketing point of view didn't mean that they really just look at the consumer um, or the customer. They, they go more to an actor-based view and look at various actors in an ecosystem that are necessary to actually create a value for the overall ecosystem. And they use the dynamic capability lens to um, using a similar sensing, seizing, and reconfiguring approach as suggested by Thies, to see in what capabilities are actually needed for a market leader, in that case for a market shape organization, to establish new resource linkages between the ecosystem players to actually create then market level financial outcomes and uh, outcomes for other stakeholders. So getting a more holistic view. So that is research that is done, uh, published in, in, in top five marketing journals, which very much lends itself also to that type of research um, that we talk about in, in strategy way more. And, and to again, um, ongoingly in the marketing uh, community, for example, there's always every few years a, a discussion on the, res the role of the resource-based view or of capabilities views in um, marketing research. And again, this is a very much approach from a strategic level. Um, uh, Burger Benefit uh, himself published a, a paper on the discussion in James at some stage. And all of that market shaping research, which they, they take ideas from strategy and apply it and link it to marketing theories, is, for example, a special interest group um, that is called Meshing Market Shaping um, Special Interest Group, uh, which comes uh, out of Australia, New Zealand, but I think has now more than 100 members uh, also from, from Europe and uh, the United States. So again, just to show you that there's a lot of capabilities and resources research actually happening outside, um, which therefore, um, to, to end this off and, and summarize, I think uh, there's a lot of potential to continue the discussion on research on market shaping, especially linking this uh, to, for example, uh, marketing research. Also, therefore, dynamic capabilities, if you go to original articles, it was very much linked to the idea of being very reactive or responsive um, to opportunities that might exist in the market. And I think Asim talked a bit about the link to entrepreneurship and the opportunity creation the discussion on how can we actually uh, possibly use a, a more proactive lens for dynamic capabilities. Um, the lack of microfoundation research, again, linking possibly to, to uh, opportunity identification of innovation research opens up again to link it to many other fields, it's entrepreneurship, uh, innovation research, organizational behavior research, which also opens up um, to some use. And I, I saw that there was a session on meter a method on uh, experiments. And we can see that there's an increasing use of experiments, but especially in that area, I think there's a lot of potential uh, to look at that. I think I talked enough about how I think uh, dynamic capabilities and resources in the context of the ecosystem deserve uh, ongoing and, and additional research attention. And I think in the, in the end, the one thing that um, I think a lot of people, including me, have talked about, but uh, being aware of the difficulties of linking the various levels. Um, so you know, if an in individual employee in a team, um, then in, a, in a, a business unit manager makes a decision, how does it go all the way up to the organization and possibly if you then go to ecosystems. So how do the various levels contribute or distract from value creation, value capture, organizational change, um, and therefore the deployment of dynamic capabilities, I think is, 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 is an area that uh, we haven't cracked quite yet. So I'm not sure I went with time because I actually completely forgot to check, but um, thank you so much.
Thank you very much to all of you for sharing uh, these insights. This was amazing. I was myself taking notes and trying to take screenshots, not to just forget a lot of uh, the ideas that were shared. So we have a couple of questions in the chat uh, that I appreciate if other folks have questions, uh, please feel free to start typing them. But before getting there, uh, I would like to ask our panelists to uh, if there is any reflection that you have with respect to the other presentations, if you would like to share this at this moment or other thoughts that were inspired as you were listening to the conversation that we're having, uh, we'll first to start with that. Connie, I've seen Kathy, Ralph. Oh. I think I had the luxury to already react to them in my talk because I had listened to all of them. So <laughs> I tried to link it to the uh, discussion around shaping ecosystems, the markets. Um, so yeah, happy to add to that, but I think the others should go first. Wonderful. Okay. If there is no burning reflection, perhaps we'll start with the first question. So, Javier, uh, you've already entered a couple of uh, links uh, between uh, Penrose's ideas and ideas that our panelists were sharing in this session, as well as a question for Connie with respect to the connection between expertise and know-how. Uh, would you like to unmute and hear your question, or I can read that completely from the chat? Let's see. I think you might have to read it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read that uh, from the chat. I know the audience here can see it, but for the recording later. So the question for Connie is, can we say that capabilities are like expertise or know-how? Uh, does it include also know why or know-how is enough for our characterization? All right, so the answer is maybe. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a hard one. You have to be more, I think you have to be more specific. So, you know, if you take the routines perspective on organizational capabilities, um, you don't necessarily need to know why, right? You just need to know kind of how, you know, what you're doing, right? Um, but, you know, at some point, somebody has to make some decisions to do something different, right? So that's like where you get to the individuals. And so I think if you're going to be making some decisions and you have some capability for making decisions, part of that probably involves knowing why. Um, so uh, that's why I said, no, well, it depends. Thank you very much. So the next question is from Swapan Gosh. And again, uh, Connie, the question is for you with respect to this temporal shift across capabilities and that whether today's dynamic capabilities can turn into tomorrow's operational capabilities. Yeah, so an operational capability is one that enables you to um, continue with the same markets, the same customer base uh, in the same, producing in the same way at the same scale with the same scope, right? A dynamic capability is directed toward changing that. So, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, I'm trying to think part of the issue with the dynamic capability, like think of R&D. Right, um, R and D in many organizations, a capability for R and D would be a dynamic capability because it's directed to changing the products and processes that you, you know, productive processes that you have. Um, however, if your organization is a, a does R and D as a contract organization for other organizations, then R and D is an, an operational capability. So it really depends on the context. So maybe you could think of an example where you decide instead of having R&D be a dynamic capability, you're going to be in the R&D business of selling that service. That would be an example where a dynamic capability could be turned into an operational one. So if you change your business from one of selling a particular product or service to selling a, a service of a dynamic capability, then maybe it could be an operational capability. But otherwise, I think they're separate. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, Sonny has a question in the chat. I see if you're here, would you like to unmute or would you like me to read your question? I think that question relates to the connection with entrepreneurial ecosystems. Yeah, you can read the question. Yeah, please go ahead if you can unmute and perhaps elaborate on the question with respect to uh, the panelists' well, discussion as well. That would be great. Oh, yeah, actually. Um... My question is, uh, we're talking about resources and uh, capabilities. So, and we also talk about the ecosystem. So I wanted to know, is there any research kind of link between the entrepreneurial ecosystems and resources and capabilities? That's my question. Thank you. I mean, I guess, let me take a stab at that. Um, I would put it the other way, like, what is it? And I don't know that there's any research about entrepreneurial ecosystems that does not think about resources and capabilities at some level, right? Because fundamentally, when we're thinking about entrepreneurial ecosystems, we're thinking about groups of firms being able to share some resources, capabilities, right? If we think about resources and capabilities as sort of broadly defined to include knowledge, to include kind of best practices to include you know, all kinds of sort of uh, other resources, then I would argue everything we do in entrepreneurial ecosystems and at some level is about how do we actually see these resources and capabilities being shared across the set of resources and helping to lift all, all boats right now. So in that sense, I think pretty much everything we're doing on entrepreneurial ecosystems is, is, in, is, is about resources and capabilities. That being said, I think there are a couple of particular specific threads that I think are very interesting. Um, so one, I, as I sort of briefly mentioned in my presentation, I think there's a, a lot of work, uh, you know, uh, thinking about kind of um, entrepreneurial resource acquisition, right? So how do entrepreneurs, when they come up with these new ideas, recruit other share, other state, other resource providers, convince them to actually contribute resources, right? And so. Uh, you know, Jay Barney uh, and, and his co-authors have some really exciting work about that. Theoretically, there's some really cool work thinking about emerging markets. Uh, you know, the, uh, SCJ, uh, I think, had a special issue that Brian Wu, Balavisa, et cetera, kind of, um, uh, you know, were, were editors for. And there's an Academy of Annals piece that Bala did that thinks about sort of this kind of process of how do we actually convince people to actually share resources with us. And, and I think that is, again, to me, inherently connected to the notion of an entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, because obviously part of what that ecosystem does is enables us to get better access to these resources and capabilities. Um, I think there's, I, having said all that, I think there is also tremendous opportunity to think about the, and, and I think this is part of the point that that analyst piece makes, to think about the terms of trade in these resources, in, right? So we have this kind of, going back to Lipman and Ruma, we know that we're going to have to find some way of specifying ex ante how we're going to share the value that we're going to create ex post, but we don't know what that ex post value creation looks like until we've actually created it. And so how do we think about who is gonna create, who's gonna capture how many values, how are the terms of trade between venture capitalists and other resource providers and the entrepreneur actually dictated? What do thin markets versus thick markets have to do with that? I think those are all fascinating questions that I think we're starting to understand uh, uh, you know, Colleen Cunningham uh, dissertation had some really exciting work thinking about this as well. But I think there's a lot more work to be done in understanding that part of the resource and capability story when it comes to entrepreneurship. If I can just jump in, I think one interesting, and I'm, I'm a newbie to entrepreneurship, co-entrepreneurship research, but just have started working with, with two co-authors in, in the area. And one thing when we uh, looked into entrepreneurial decision-making um, of, of, of we're entrepreneurs of the individual. There's a lot of research and entrepreneurship on the individual and how they make decision, alliance partners, um, access to resources, market entry, a lot of it which it lends itself to a, for example, dynamic managerial capabilities view and, and the micro foundations discussion and strategy. Um, when I wanted uh, for that particular experiment, uh, measure also some aspects of dynamic managerial capabilities, such as cognition, human capital, social capital, um, I was kind of shut down that it's not a topic that the entrepreneurship folks talk about. They said, nah, they must. So I actually Googled, um, Googled. I looked in, into ETP and JBV, how many papers they've published with that, and there's not much. 
So I think there's a lot of individual level research where resources uh, understanding and DC understanding might actually be very, also very, could be a very promising area um, moving forward. Thank you for the insights, Asim and Raf. Uh, perhaps I'll read the next question that's from uh, Deepak. Uh, with respect to challenges that RBB faces in measurement of some of the critical constructs in the field, and that I remember when I was myself a doctoral student, uh, Joe Mahoney in our resources and capability session used to like take uh, Connie's 1997 paper, what measurement of resources and capabilities in the petroleum industry in Henderson and Clark's paper with respect to the pharmaceutical industry in, uh, sorry, Henderson and Cockburn paper in pharmaceutical industry as gold standards of the time you were taking classes and measurement. And we're now 20 uh, years almost later. If you could share perhaps some of the best practices with respect to empirical measurement of capabilities where you see that could go, I think that could be a broader generalization of the EPAX class question here. Um, okay, maybe I'll take a stab at this. Um, I, I think that um, so it, it, it's like any construct, right? You, you, you're going to measure it with a proxy, right? Um, in quantitative research, right? Which is I, what I presume the question is asking about. Uh, and so, you know, the proxy I use, that was a really coarse proxy. We can do better than that today. I mean, you know, for, I used them, um, I was interested in um, like measuring technological expertise, right? Uh, both at the organization level an individual level um, I had data with my colleagues, Christian Stadler, Sadler and John Mario Verona. Um, at multi-firm level, I had some within the firms for individuals. And so I looked to see for, you know, one measure of a capability is since we know they develop through experience, you can measure the experience uh, and say, you know, with this experience, more of this experience, you know, you're more likely to have a capability of this type, right? So that's one proxy for a capability, for example, right? You can also um, measure them as, you know, th there's a whole stream of resources and capabilities, right? One, you know, if I have experience, uh, I might use it in some kind of project, right? So I can think of the use of the capability as sort of a proxy for having the capability and I can predict whether, you know, seeing this application then predicts some kind of outcome of that application. So you can think either about inputs to the capability like experience or outputs um, as then a predictor of some other outcome like performance. So that, that's how I think about doing it uh, for capability. For resources, uh, those are easier to measure, right? How many, you know, employees of a certain type with a certain amount of experience do you have to go to the point about HR as a resource, right? You know, what kind of physical assets do you have? I mean, can you get, if you can get measures of this, right? Some of this, you really do need some firm level data, but I, I think resources are a little easier, particularly the tangible resources. You know, intangible knowledge or people use patents. It used to drive me nuts, but honestly, sometimes it's the best we have, right? So things like that. The resources are a little easier. I think I just want to add, I think there will always be also a set of measures for a construct, right? So if I, I go back to my starting point of my PhD, brand equity. We know there are a lot of companies out there that measures brand value, brand equity um, with different methodologies and all say they're the best they exist. I'm talking about companies um, that, that spend millions of dollars in doing that, which we then possibly can get access to that data. But even then you can't say this one is the one you should use, right? Because they are based on different methodologies um, there as well. So I think that's also to keep in mind that it might not be for the type of data you have, not the one measure that will work for everything. And I would just add, I think, I think in empirical work, I think we've got a lot better at looking at 
kind of ratios of outputs to inputs, right? So I think we are actually often capable of, uh, to Connie's point earlier, I think it's not, we don't have to look only at inputs, we can look at sort of outputs and inputs and then look at the sort of conversion technology, right? So like, uh, I mean, again, in, in my paper with Brian Wu, uh, we, we calculated the efficiency of every single establishment, right? By looking at the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and that was our measure of capability. I think there's a lot of cool work I mean, taking patents, but not just looking at sort of the counter patents or something like that, but looking at the ratio of patent, you know, outputs or citation outputs to R&D spending. And maybe not has some really cool work on the IQ index. Uh, there's work in entrepreneurship where, you know, the cartography project is calculating kind of, uh, in, you know, quality of entrepreneurship indices. So I think we've got better empirically. I mean, again, I totally a second Ralph's point about it's going to need to be specific to your specific context, but in that context, you can find, you know, I think fairly, uh, I think we've got a lot better at finding really kind of specific proxies of inputs, outputs to inputs. And I think that's really, to me, the cutting edge of capability measurement is today. And as if you have those, you really don't run into this, oh, it's too fuzzy kind of problem because, you know, it just shuts reviewers up, frankly. And further to that fuzzy comment, I, I can see the comment in the in, in the chat that uh, Asim was just just talking about, saying that there are you know mainstream researchers who who think this theory is fuzzy. You know, some of those criticisms say it's conceptually fuzzy, not just measurement. And you know, you have to ask yourself: Is it just philosophically they have a different view of things? Because you know, there are are some researchers that that's view an organization as a social entity and they use a sociological lens to examine everything. Well, resource and capability theories don't don't really speak to that. They take a different view. So it could just be a a philosophical difference, but but even if they are willing to take an economic view, um, I think it's also it creates an obligation on our part to be clear about what we're talking about. And I guess it gets a little bit back to, to that comment I made a bit earlier about are you just using the word resource without really thinking about the package of arguments, theoretical arguments that you're bundling with it and making sure that those arguments are coherent, that they are internally consistent and they, they work together. Or are you taking one piece from one resource-based perspective another piece from another resource-based perspective without really thinking about how they go together because we're talking here about a collection of resource and capabilities theories. It's not one uniform, coherent, tightly tightly wound piece. There, there, there are these different streams, different aspects and Connie, Connie did a good job of, of laying out some of those, 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 different, uh, those different areas. So I think the criticisms of fuzziness some people are never going to buy into it. It's just not their view of organizations or their view of the world. Um, but I think we can also do a better job of being clear about how what, what exactly we are communicating and what assumptions we're making and what sets of arguments we are truly drawing on. To just jump on, on Kathy's so comment a lot. Sorry. Sure, Ralph. Is that okay if we actually take one more question and answer yeah, yeah. the other one in the chat? Because uh, Nikisha also had a question that takes us fast forward perhaps to 2022 and some of the more recent challenges with respect to applications of RBB. Would you like to unmute? Uh, yes, thank you so much. This is a fantastic panel. Um, so I just wanted to get your opinion with the great, great resignation happening and so many firms seeing a lot of turnover, what are your thoughts on examining human resources and talent as a resource of the firm? And how should firms be thinking about talent now, given that so many people are leaving or changing careers? Thank you. So, um, I mean, I think, I think it goes back to the payments perspective, right? And thinking about, and I mean, I think also to sort of a lot of this new work on stakeholder theory, just saying, okay, how much how are we sharing the value that these resources are creating, right? And if I, I would argue the great resignation is telling us maybe we aren't sufficiently compensating people uh, for the value that they are creating. Uh, and if we're not doing that, then uh, maybe we need to be doing better at that, right? So I think, uh, I, I, so I mean, I guess my first point is I don't think you want to overstress. I mean, again, I think some of the evidence on great resignation is still not so clear. And I think there's, 
always danger when picking a very narrow phenomenon and building a research agenda around that. But I think to the extent that it opens up interesting questions, I think it in, opens up questions about the nature of capitalism and how we share value with employees and whether that is really sustainable. Uh, and uh, again, I think there's some very cool work about how we actually are, uh, again, you know, thinking about this payments perspective and thinking about how the value of these resources is being compensated and how we're sharing value with employees. So uh, to me, that's the question set of questions that I think it opens up. Uh, and it, I think also opens up questions about market correction and how do we, you know, how do firms actually respond to the fact that they're not able to get talent, right? So a neoclassical view of the market would say, well, we should just start paying them more money immediately Clearly, that's not happening. And so I think it's a great opportunity to think about market frictions broadly and why do we maybe not see that kind of adjustment uh, in resources. Um, so that would be my take. So, so I appreciate everybody's insights, your time, generosity, but uh, sharing your view of our resources and capabilities. This was a fascinating session. I wish we could go on for another hour with these conversations. Uh, and I'm sorry to have cut uh, the conversation premature, but this is the end of the session. Uh, thanks to all of you who are attending the session at this moment, to those of you who are sharing your time to watch the video later, and a big, big thanks uh, to our panelists for doing the research in this area to inform us in the first place and then being willing to share it with us uh, in today's session. Thank you. And thank you to Maka for organizing this great session. She's been doing these Meet the Theories. I really appreciate all of her help this, this academic year. Thank you, Maka.